Bob, do me a favor. Tell everybody, you got a great story about what God has done in your life. Tell everybody in the next, in, say two minutes, just shrink that bad boy down. Tell everybody what God has done in your life over the last few years. Two minutes is a tough task for me, or those of you who know me, right? I could speak all day. The truth is, what God's done in my life is just unbelievable. Um, I spent the first 52 years of my life going after what we all seem to go after, the material things in life, and I was pretty good at it. I got very successful, so I forgot about a lot of the things that really make us who we are. I found myself 10 years ago just roaming the streets here in Sanford, a professional man that was completely empty on the inside. If you had turned me inside out, I would look like I had cancer. But I looked good on the outside, I thought, anyways. Uh, this man behind me right here, John, saw me wandering in a parking lot and said, what is going on with Bob? And he took me in. And from that day, I say that's when my recovery started. I, uh, I'm not going to get into what I did wrong because that's easy, everything. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> so I've been sober for 10 years this month. I haven't had to pick up a drink. And that's thanks to everybody there, everybody here, and all the good friends that God put back in my life. I now have a wife who waited for me while I did my crazy things for 10 years. We've been together 30 years, and, and now we're back together. She took me back, so that's amazing. I also have a stepdaughter that I inherited <laughs> through my craziness, and uh, she says to me, I like this new Bob, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I don't know what else to say. You know, the, uh, I, I was sober for 10 years, I said, but not really till I got here to Curtis Lake Church. I was a dry drunk. When I got here, I found out what it meant to be a really sober person, and that is, I now say, when I go to my Celebrate Recovery meetings, and some of you who are out there, I love you all. Hi, my name is Bob. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I am an alcoholic, and I'm proud to say so. Thank you. It's good stuff. Good stuff. That's what uh, in church world we call a testimony, if you know that or not, which is a long syllable word for story, because in church we like to use long words to show how smart we are. So I know some of you are new to the whole church thing. Give it a few years. You too will sound intelligent. We'll bear with you in your one and two syllable words. All right? So uh, just hang with us. We're glad you're here. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get together? Wouldn't it be great if we could just all come together and love one another and get along? But we don't. I mean, we hear the story of Bob, who really is a product of somebody coming alongside of him and loving him, and, and that's wonderful, but the reality is when we think about our lives, it's not that easy because we're all different. So we're in our series, God's Grammy Awards, and we've kind of started with this verse, ears to hear and eyes to see, both are a gift from the Lord. It's found in the book of Proverbs. And what we're saying is, God, open up our eyes and open up our ears to hear your truth in some of the songs that are in our culture, some of those experiences that we have as we're driving down the street, because all truth is God's truth. And, and this song today about getting together, I mean, there's some truth there that God wants us to get together, to love one another, but it's difficult. It's difficult in our world, but then when you start talking about within the church, with people who profess Jesus Christ is Lord, with people who say like Bob, I am a believer in Jesus Christ, I follow Jesus, it is no easier. It, it's, it's just as difficult. In fact, let me tell you how difficult it is for us to kind of get along and be unified. I am what is called a pastor, which means they pay me to love God, which is a cool, cool deal because you love God for free. I get a paycheck for it. So it tells you, again, how smart I am, that and my many syllable words. Um, but but uh, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, not how smart I am. I'm very smart that, that being paid to love Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. So I have been ordained three times. I've gone through ordination. Another big word. You're welcome. And... Uh, 
You can write these down all day long if you want to. They're going to just come out today. So uh, I've been ordained. I've gone through the ordination process three times, which is when a group of people look at you and say, okay, you're allowed to love God professionally. That's what they do. They say, you can love God professionally. You can serve the church. You can preach the word. You've gone through what you need to go through. We confirm on you. You're all the duties and rights and responsibilities. And then I get to marry people. I get to bury people. I get to talk with people, counsel, all that good stuff. Now, I've done this three times. I started, uh, my first ordination was at a church I was an associate pastor uh, with, and became, I was the youth pastor, became the associate pastor, served there for about 10 years, about year five or six. Uh, I went through the ordination process, had to write a paper on different theological topics, lots of big words in that one. If you want it, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. And uh, then I had to meet with the ordination council, who then asked me questions. I had to defend that paper, and then they conferred on me the rights of a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had a service. I got all dressed up, wore a suit, both bow tie, ponytail, and earring. I got the pictures to prove it, all right? And uh, they laid their hands on me, which is a church thing to do. I know it's kind of weird. We don't do that really anyplace else, but we do it in church. And uh, they prayed over me and said, boom, there you go. So it's great. It's ordained, loved it, good stuff. Then when I came here to Curtis Lake, I moved my credentials to a different uh, organization, a different denomination because of an affiliation that the church had or has it, uh, with them. And over a couple years, it kind of became evident to me that this isn't a really great fit. And so I kind of had a conversation about some of the beliefs that I held about the Bible and some of the beliefs that they held. And the conversation kind of went like, well, we think it'd be good for you to get your ordination with someplace else then. <laughs> And it wasn't mean, it wasn't bad, it was just the reality, there's just sending some differences. So I moved on to my third ordination now with uh, a group called the Four C's. Finally, somebody will have me, which is exciting. Um, but uh, the, the Four C's, which is the Conservative Christian Congregational Conference, that's a lot of syllables. That's right. I just keep moving up in the world. And so now I'm with the Four C's, and uh, I went through their ordination process. And here's what's fascinating. Did I change much during that, you know, say 15, 20 years of ministry? No, not really. But just trying to find a home, find a place that, that I could kind of be a part of was difficult because everybody believes differently. Everybody has these different nuances. In fact, there are over 40,000 Christian denominations in the world today. 40,000 denominations. Now, by denominations, I don't mean ones, fives, tens, twenties. I'm talking about organizations that have, have come together based around certain beliefs that they hold. So you have Methodists, and you have uh, Baptists, and you have Congregationalists, and you've got Assemblies of God, and you've got all these different types of denominations. And you have 40,000 of them, the research, the latest research shows. Not only do you have 40,000 of these denominations, but they have been divided into six major divisions. Think of the words that we're using here for the body of Christ. They have been divided into six divisions. You have independents. You've got Protestants. You've got Roman Catholics. You've got Orthodox people. You've got marginals. Whew, let me get started on them. And then you've got the Anglicans, right? Not that the word marginal is pejorative at all for those believers, right? But, but we have these divisions. So here's the reality, right? We have 40,000 denominations that make up probably around 30 million churches that make up about 3.2 billion Christians, all serving one Jesus. How does that happen? That's, that's difficult to just come together, but it is the reality that we live in. And so what we do very well in the body of Christ is we love the world, right? And some churches do better at this than others, but the reality is we focus on loving our world and bringing the hope of Jesus Christ to those who don't know him. Bob shared in one of the services that he said, you know, uh, I found Jesus. He said, but you know, the reality is Jesus was never lost. I was. Jesus found me. And so the church has this wonderful ability to focus on lost people and say, you know, we're going to share the hope of God, but we're just going to insult each other all the way there, right? I mean, that's kind of what we do as this, as this group of people, these 3.2 billion Christians that, are, that make up about 30 million churches, that make up about, about uh, 40,000 denominations that are divided into six categories to serve one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is no wonder we haven't killed all of ourselves. It is no wonder we haven't got into these massive church wars. It is amazing how difficult it is to just come together because we all have these different beliefs. So today, I want to talk specifically to those in the room who you call yourselves Christians. And I recognize that not everybody in the room is there yet. 
Not everybody in the room would say, I'm following Jesus. I'm a grateful follower of Christ. But I want to talk to those of you today who are. And I want to talk about this reality of what the Bible says about how we're supposed to love each other. And if you're here today and you say, you know, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. And so now you're going to start talking to Christians and I'm not going to get anything out of it. Just stay with me. Because I think I might be able to help today you understand how Christians should behave towards one another. Because you've probably experienced the reality that sometimes Christians aren't nice to each other. That sometimes Christians disagree and they don't disagree in the most respectful and loving of ways. So, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on challenging ourselves who are Christians. What does it mean to love another Christian? How are we supposed to go about living together amongst our 40,000 different denominations? All right, so here's what we're going to do. First of all, I want to look at a very, very famous passage in the Bible on love. Okay, it's not the one you're thinking of that's found in 1 Corinthians that they read at every wedding. It's a different passage that's pretty famous, all right? And then what I want to do is I want to answer the question, what do we do with the weirdos? Exactly. What do we do? Because here's the deal. You automatically thought of somebody else. You, you're a weirdo. There's a whole bunch of people out in our world today that would think every one of you is a weirdo because you're sitting in church on a Sunday. I know, I know, Chris, I know. You don't need to, right? I mean, we, 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 we come to church and there's a whole bunch of people that would say, well, you're weird for doing that. And then some of you came to church today and you stood up and sang to nobody. You just stood there singing, just singing. And so people would say, well, that's weird. And then some of you, not only did you sing, some of you raised your hands. Like, like, that's weird. Like, what are you, holding up something? You're grabbing? What do you see that I don't see, right? And some of you are even more weird. Some of you were like this during the music. You were like, (laughs) you were like going at it. You know, you're just like singing, and you're going for it, and you're moving, and the people next to you are like, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." (laughs) not with me, not with me. Because somebody looks at you and goes, well, that's weird. And then some of you, at the end of the service, they're going to pass this little white bucket, and you're going to drop 10% of your hard-earned money in that bucket. And some people are going to go, well, you're weird. Now, the point is, all of us have somebody looking at us going, well, that's weird, or you're weird. So what do we do when we see somebody that we think, well, that's weird that they do that? And I want to answer that question, how do we deal with that? What do we do? Okay. And then finally, I'm going to give everybody in here some free fashion advice. And some of you need it. Because I saw you walk in today. I saw what you were wearing, okay? This is church, all right? So that's what's going to happen. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, turn them on. Scroll over to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 19. That's where we're going to sit today, all right? Some of you old-fashioned people, probably over the age of 40, have paper Bibles, right? Which are good. Get a paper Bible, All right, but if you have your Bible, it's electronic, turn it on, flip over to your Bible, all right, and uh, let's look at this book. If you're not sure where 1 John is, it's in the New Testament, it's right before 2 John. Not helpful, I know, but still a funny joke, all right? So let me tell you something that's fascinating about this little letter. This is a little postcard written by, you know, traditionally it's thought that John, the disciple of Jesus, had wrote this letter, and what John is doing is he's addressing in this letter some really strange beliefs that have kind of entered into the Christian church. And he's addressing that there are groups of people that believe certain things about Jesus that they think are weird. And so basically what happens is Jesus comes to this earth, people love him, they follow him, he does miracles, he, he says he's the son of God, he say, calls himself the son of man, he, he walks around and he dies this death of a criminal and he appears to some of his followers after being dead, alive, And then he ascends into heaven as some eyewitnesses saw. And then immediately they started arguing about who Jesus was and what was it like. And so one of the things that John is addressing in this letter is a group of people who thought that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh, that he just kind of came in spirit, that he didn't actually suffer physically because he wasn't a physical person. And so John in his letter is addressing some of these issues. And as he's talking about the differences, he gets to this chapter and he deals with how you kind of should be interacting with one another as Christians. So he's specifically talking about Christians, one to another, people who follow this person, Jesus. Even if they maybe follow it differently, here's how you can tell this is a person who is a Christian and how you should treat them. All right, so here's what it says. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Sounds good. For love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. 
But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So John says here, if you don't love, then you don't know God. It's impossible to say you love God, but if you don't love one another, then you don't love God. And he goes on in this letter. He says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So what John is saying here is, listen, real love is not the fact that we love God. As a Jewish person, John would say that's easy for us to love God because we know that he rescued us from Egypt. We know that he established us as his chosen people. We know that, that he loves us. The point is, real love is that God loved us before we ever acknowledged him. That's love, that we didn't do anything to earn it. He loved us so much that in our sin, he sent his only son to die on a cross, that he made that incredible sacrifice on our behalf so that we could be made right with him, so that we could have a relationship with him now and intimacy with God the Father now and eternity with him. And, and what John is saying is that's love. He goes on, he says, dear friends, since God loved us that much, that much meaning to send his only son to die on a cross, we surely ought to love each other. For no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Right? So what John, what John says here is, hey, real love requires sacrifice, but then he also goes on to talk about something very interesting, and he says, no one has ever seen God. Remember, John is Jewish, and the Jewish people understood that if you saw God, you just dropped dead. You couldn't possibly stand in the presence of God. God is almighty. He is all-knowing. He is all-perfect, and his glory and who God is as an entity would overwhelm, and we would not be able to stand in his presence. So the Bible says that no one has ever seen God. God. And so John says, listen, nobody can see God, but when God lives in us and we love people, we are showing a full expression of his love. And in particular, when we love one another, when we love fellow believers in Jesus Christ, that's the power of it. So he goes on to say this, and God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. This just simply means that when a person professes that Jesus Christ is God, that they surrender their life to him, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, fills their life and gives them power to live a righteous life, gives them power to do the right thing, gives them power to, to uh, have patience and self-control. We talked about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. All of these things are things that the Holy Spirit does inside of us. It's the Holy Spirit that allows us to control our tongue when we want to lash out at other people. It is the Holy Spirit who allows us to love people who are unlovable, it's not on our own. And what scripture says is that if you are not loving people, then God doesn't live inside of you. But if you are loving people, that is the testimony, that's the story, that's the proof that God does actually live in you. And so it's that spirit that's working. And furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. So he's getting at, we've seen with our own eyes, he was actually here. He's kind of talking to that group of people that believe differently than him. He actually sent his son. That's that incredible act of love. And here's what's the key. Here's the central part. All who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. So for John, the key is, do you say and do you live out this reality that Jesus is the son of God? If that's the case, then that is what brings us together. And we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. And all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. Here's the reality. Love professes itself in our actions. When we say, if you're in here and you say, Jesus is the Son of God, and I'm not talking about you just say it, because anybody can say it, but when you declare it, when your life declares that Jesus is the Son of God, it expresses it through love, through words that are kind, through words that are uplifting, through the forgiveness of those who don't deserve to be forgiven. This is the expression that love requires of us. And that's what John is getting at. He's saying, listen, if you say that Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives inside of you, and because God lives inside of you, you have a love for those who are in the body of Christ that is supernatural, that's given to you by the Holy Spirit. And he says, and we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in that love, for God is love. Not God displays love, not God 
explains love, but God is love. Love is God. And all who live in love live in God. So when we live by this law of love, to love one another, to speak kindly of one another, to forgive one another, when we live in love, we live in God, and God lives in us. And this is so powerful. He says, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. How many of you are glad that the Bible teaches that love grows, that it doesn't just stay in its position, that it's not expected that you love perfectly on day one. How many of you are happy about that? Because it is very difficult to love. How many of you are married? Raise your hand up. And I say, hi. Keep your hand up if you're happily married at least 70% of the time. Okay, 60, 50, 40. Okay, I think we got everybody's hands back up. 40% of the time. Now listen, you know if you're married in here, that to love someone perfectly, it grows. It takes time. It's not something that happens right away. And it's the same that's true. When we come into the body of Christ, we don't immediately love people. We don't immediately love everybody because some of us are weird. Some of us just don't like people. I don't like people, right? We just, we, we just are unique and different. But over time, the Spirit works in our lives, and we learn to love, and we express that love, and it grows more perfect. Not perfect in it doesn't ever make a mistake, but it grows more complete, more full, right, it is the perfect expression of what love is. We are able to express it perfectly. To forgive long before anyone ever asks for forgiveness is a perfect expression of God's love, right? Now, he says, so we will not be afraid. Now this word fear comes in. He didn't be talking about fear, but all of a sudden he starts talking about fear. Now, so that we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him, that's God, with confidence. Why? Because we're such good people. Why? Because we've said the right prayer. Why? Because we go to the right church. Why? Because we've signed the right paper. No. Why? Because we live like Jesus here in this world. And given the context, what did Jesus do while he was here in this world? He loved people. It's not a trick question. I'm not that deep. I can't think of trick questions. He loved people. He expressed the love of the Father perfectly. And John says, listen, you're going to have to stand before God one day. I'm going to have to stand before God one day. And that can be a fearful thought. But as we love perfectly, as we live in God, as we live in love, that fear goes away. Because that kind of love, this perfect expression of love towards other people in the body of Christ, that has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. Any teenagers in the house? Raise your hand up nice and high. Teenagers. Teenagers. Teenagers, I want you to think. I know this is going to be difficult for you. Let's just start right, right there. I'm just kidding, right? Teenagers, here we go. Think for a second. You did something wrong. I know you're going to have to think back a long way. You did something wrong. Mom and dad didn't know about it, but you know you have to tell them. You are afraid of what? Punishment, right? Now, what happens when mom and dad don't respond the way you expect them to respond? You tell them, mom, dad, I did this, I did that, I did this at school, I broke this, I stole this, I stayed here, I did that, I shouldn't have, I won't, well, whatever. But instead of punishment, they look at you and they offer forgiveness and they say, okay, it's all right, I love you, let's talk about what happened, right? What happens in that moment? Fear what? <sighs> Goes away. See, this is what it means that perfect love drives out fear. When we respond perfectly to imperfect situations, that's this perfect expression of love, and fear goes away. And it's the same with us when we stand before God. If we express his love perfectly, even though we make mistakes, when we stand before God on the day of judgment, we don't have to be afraid because we've experienced God's love, and we have the full expression of God's love. And the Bible says that if we are afraid of that day, it's for fear of punishment, and it shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. This is why people who are deeply in love with Jesus and God can forgive others so easily. This is why people who are deeply and passionately in love with Jesus can let things roll off their back sometimes, can walk through extraordinary circumstances and still have this joy of the Lord. It's because they have experienced this full expression of God's love and it then can be displayed to other people. It's this recognition that, you know what, I am messed up. I love what Bob said. I don't need to talk about what I did wrong because I did everything wrong. Now there's a guy who's not, gonna, who's not afraid to stand before God on judgment day because he's experienced the perfect expression of God's love and now shows it. And that's what we're called to do with one another. And so the more we love, the more love we find, right, in ourselves, in other people, the more fear we lose. 
It's the, what that song says, right? We hold the key to fear and love in our trembling hands, right? It's the same thing. They're attached. They're related. The more we love, the less we fear. The more you love, the less people will fear. In the body of Christ, the more we love people that believe differently, that act differently, that think differently, the less we will fear their beliefs, the less they will fear our beliefs, the more unity and more harmony we can have. And John finishes this section of his letter with this really cool statement. This is so great. We love each other because he first loved us. Let that sink in for a second. We tend to love each other because we like one another. We tend to love each other because someone earns our love, because they're nice to us, because they give us love. But John is saying, listen, what motivates your love for one another is the fact that God first loved you before you loved him. He says your relationship with God, it determines the way in which you love and how you should love. And the model that we've been given is a God who loved you so much that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for us. And we often think of love as something that is earned, but what this passage teaches us and what this passage redeems in our hearts and what the the depravity of who we are that this passage points out is that without the Spirit of God, without God's work inside of us, I will always need people to earn my love. But with God working inside of me, I can be redeemed in the way I love can be redeemed and I can start expressing love without expecting it to be earned. Because the love that God wants you and I to hand out, the love that we are to live out is love that is expressed and not earned. How many relationships would that change? How much pain would you see gone in your life if you could learn to express love and not wait for someone to earn it? But that's what it happens when we truly experience God's love. It transforms us. It shapes the way we interact with our children, with our spouse, with fellow Christians in particular in this passage that believe differently than we do. And so the point that John is making here, and it's a big point, is that if you're going to love the invisible God, it means that you must love his visible followers. That if you're going to say, I love God, if you're going to say that I'm following God, then that means you have to love his visible followers. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot say, okay, I'm going to love God, but I'm not going to like this person over here. I'm not going to give of myself to this person who loves God as well because they believe differently than I do, because they hold a different view than I do. That God loved us first. We're called to love first. Doesn't matter whether a person earns it. Doesn't matter what they believe. Doesn't matter if it's different. We love first. And in doing that, it expels the fears that we have of other people's beliefs and other people's practices. So what do we do then? If this is what we're called to do, if this is what the Bible says you're supposed to love first, extend this kind of love, what do you do with the weirdos, right? By your standard, what do you do with the people that believe differently than you do? Because let's face it, in the Christian church right now, at large, there are are probably a handful of topics that are highly divisive that people argue over. Top three right now in the church, I'll tell you. You want to hear them? Good, because I'm going to tell you anyway, all right? Here's what they are. Number one issue right now in the Christian faith is the issue of homosexuality. What does the Bible actually teach about this? What is the Christian church? What does it mean to be a Christian who is a homosexual? What does that mean? And so there's all kinds of debate, and there's anger, and there's fuel, and there's nastiness within the body of Christ. I'm not talking about between Christians and non-Christians. I'm talking about within the body of Christ. Second major issue facing the Christian church that causes all kinds of tension is this doctrine called universalism. Again, big word, you're welcome. Universalism is the belief that one day God will rescue and redeem all of humanity regardless of what they profess or believe on earth. And so this is a, this is a huge dividing point amongst Christian churches of what does it mean to say that Jesus Christ died once and for all? Okay, does that mean that everybody's going to be redeemed, or does it mean only the people who profess Jesus as Lord are going to be redeemed? And so that's a a hot-button topic, right? So universalism, homosexuality, and then the third big issue that divides Christian church and the, the body of Christ is politics. If you follow Jesus, are you supposed to be a Democrat? Are you supposed to be a Republican? Are you supposed to be independent? Are you supposed to be a part of the Tea Party, the Coffee Party? Are you supposed to be an anarchist? What does that mean? Are you allowed to vote? Should you vote? Should you cheat when you vote just to make sure that you win? What do you do? 
Are you a socialist? Are you a Marxist? Are you communist? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a Christian and be involved in politics? Should you vote? Should you not vote? Is the kingdom of this world not the kingdom of his, of, the, of our Lord and Savior? What does that mean? And so churches and, and Christians, they get into these massive debates. These are the three big issues. So what happens when you meet somebody who's a Christian that you think is a weirdo because of some of their beliefs in some of these areas or because they worship differently? What should you do? Here's what I would say. First thing, somebody say invite them to Curtis Lang. <laughs> These are rhetorical questions, people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so here's what you do, right? First of all, remember this one very important point that no one has perfect theology, not even you. Doesn't matter how many sermons you've listened to, especially of mine. Doesn't matter how much of the Bible you've read, how many degrees you have. It does not matter. No one has perfect understanding of God. And so it's very important. It's very, very important very important that we recognize that when I talk with people, I have to come with a sense of humility. I have to come with this sense that, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I love God dearly. Maybe I've looked at this in Scripture, you know, very responsibly. Maybe I have great hermeneutical skills. That's another big word for you. Maybe I can exegete the passage perfectly. But you know what? I could be wrong. I could be missing something. And so you come to those conversations with a sense of humility to talk with one another. Second thing is this. We should come to those conversations with a thankful heart that there is diversity in expression amongst Christians. We should be thankful that there is diversity in Christian expression because if there were not diverse churches, we would all have to worship the same way. We'd all have to sing the same songs. We'd all have to have music at the same level. We'd all have to sit, kneel, stand, do whatever, repeat after me. We'd all have to do it the same way and God has made us all unique. And so we should be thankful that there are unique expressions of the body of Christ that we can enjoy and that we can say, you know what? You love God. I love God. You believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm happy that you go to this church or that you're a part of this denomination because it fits in alignment with what you believe. And you can have conversations about that, but be thankful that there's diversity there. doesn't mean you have to agree with it. You're probably going to walk away from the conversation thinking, well, they're weird. And they're going to walk away from the conversation going, well, they're weird. But I love them. And they're still part of the body of Christ, and it's not my decision to decide whether they are or they aren't. And as you have these conversations, as you sit and talk with people about what does it mean to say that the body of Christ is represented in communion, because I know you have that conversation. What does it mean to sit and talk about, well, what does the Bible actually say about politics, and what does it mean to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's, and what does it mean to to, you know, to, to submit to the rulers of the land. And you have these deep theological conversations. I know you do. And when you have those conversations and you, you get to areas of disagreement, I want to encourage you to celebrate the gospel. Celebrate the gospel message in those moments. Don't ever lose sight of what is central, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent to this earth as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins so that we could be made right with God and have eternity with him. And, and celebrate that. And, and we might have differences of opinions on some of these other issues, but celebrate the gospel. Never lose sight. Let that be the center of everything. And exist and have good conversations. And that leads to the last thing is don't insult, don't argue, pray, and understand. Don't insult people because they think differently than you do, because they act differently than you do, because they believe differently than you do. Don't name call Don't get into all that stuff. There's no place for that in the kingdom of God. Don't argue with people. Have conversations. I'm all for conversations. My background and and where I studied required me to sit with people who were a lot smarter than me, who had very different views of the Bible and different views of things, and I just had to learn to listen and try to understand. Did I agree? Absolutely not. Some of them were weird. I told you that at the beginning. There are weirdos out there. And you know what? They sat around the table going, that guy is weird. How could he possibly believe that? And that's just, that's how we are with one another. But it's important in those moments that we learn to listen. And believe it or not, John says the answer is to pray. Listen to what John says. This is so powerful. Same letter, a little bit later on. This is what he says in chapter 5. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should go tell them that they're sinning. You should write a paper publish a book. You should get a sign, get a magic marker, go stand outside their church. That's not, that's what we do. It's not there. Oh, we should pray. We should pray. 
And God will tell them they're horrible. God will send them to hell. God will show them how terrible of a person they are. And God will give that person life. And where has that been my whole life? Where is that passage when we're out protesting churches that we don't agree with? Where is that passage when we're screaming and yelling on Hannity and Combs with Christians and all these different television shows? Where is that? Where is that when we can't stand with our Catholic brothers and sisters? Like, where is that passage of Scripture? How come we aren't living this out? Because this seems like the most simple, most understandable thing. Now, it does mention this one thing that's kind of interesting. A sin that leads to death. Now, here's what's fascinating. Here's what he says. John says, but there is a sin. There is a sin that leads to death. Notice it is singular. He doesn't say there are some sins that lead to death. He says there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. (laughs) That's bizarre, if you ask me. Like, John's talking about love and compassion. He says, listen, you see somebody who's going against what you believe to be true. They're behaving in a way that's a sin, right? You, You pray for them. As long as that person isn't doing a sin that leads to death, and there is a sin that leads to death, there's one, a sin that leads to death, and you know what? I'm not even saying you should waste your time praying for them because it's not going to do any good. And that's all, that's what he's saying here. Now, this begs the question, what? What's the sin? He doesn't say. Yeah. Tell me about it. He doesn't say what the sin is. You would expect the next thing would be, and so here's what you need to look out for. It's those people that are in the tea party. (laughs) Here's what you should look out for. It's those people that don't believe that you should raise your hands in church. It's those people that don't have instruments. It's those people that believe this about homosexuality. It's those people that believe that about this topic and politics, whatever it might be. But he doesn't say what it is. This is what he says. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. So pray. Just pray. Pray. See, I I happen to hold a view of Scripture that says Scripture is inspired by God. That it is God at work through human beings, and we have the Scripture now in the way in which God wants us to have it. And if God wanted us to know what that sin was, he would have told us. But he doesn't want us to know. And you want to know my opinion as to why he doesn't want us to know? Because we're foolish enough to spend our whole lives watching for that sin and not doing anything else. If he were to tell us that, we'd spend our whole lives, every year there'd be 12 new dissertations written so people would get their doctorate in theology telling us how to watch out for the sin that leads to death. We'd have committees at our churches specifically to watch for people who are committing that sin that leads to death. We would have a staff person in charge to develop a strategy and system to make sure that no one ever does the sin that leads to death. And God in his infinite wisdom spared us of that lunacy. But gave us the point, guess what? You're never going to convince people anyway. It's a matter between them and God. So pray, and God will give them life. That's the ultimate thing you can do. Somebody that's a weirdo to you, you pray for them. You love them, and God will give them life. And guess what? If they're doing that sin that leads to death, maybe you've got it figured out. John says, yeah, don't even worry about it anyway. (laughs) Why? It's not rocket science. Hold true to your convictions, what the Spirit of God allows you to. Take the Word of God seriously. I'm not saying compromise those things, but when somebody does something that you disagree with and, and they call themselves a Christian and they have a different view of Scripture, pray for them. Listen to them, have conversations, let them know why you believe what you believe. Do it in a respectful, loving way. Love one another, serve one another. Don't be afraid of that. Because you can't do anything anyway, even if it is the sin that leads to death. And when we do that, when we love other believers, we become the best Christian apologists out there. Apologist, another great big word for you today. This doesn't mean we go around saying we're sorry for God. What a Christian apologist is a person who goes and defends the faith. They'll write and they'll study and they'll defend that Jesus is Lord, that God is real. And the greatest way that you and I can become apologists, proving the existence of God in Christ is by loving other Christians. That's what Jesus said. Jesus prayed this in John 17. He said, I am in them. Jesus is the I here. Them are his followers. He says, I am in them, and you, the Father, are in me. 
right? This is this unification. This is how close we are. He says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Here's what's fascinating. Jesus prays that we would love one another as Christians and be so unified because that's what is the best expression of God's love for our world. Jesus didn't pray, Lord, help them serve all the poor all over the world so that people will know that I'm from you. Because there are lots of people that serve the poor all over the world. That's not going to prove it. Should we do that? Yes. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Jesus doesn't say, oh, you know what? Give them perfect theology so that people will understand and know without a shadow of a doubt that I came from you. Jesus said, what is the greatest proof, the greatest evangelistic tool is when Christians are unified? Because where do you see that? Where do people love people first? Where is that in our world? It's nowhere. But if the body of Christ were to get itself together and serve one another, love one another, create community where nobody is left out, create community where justice exists amongst one another, will love exist amongst one another who, uh, who disagree, then the world would know that Jesus sent him and how much the fa- that, that Jesus was sent by the Father and how much the Father loves them. So how do we get unified? That's the question. How, do we, how does our unity become perfected? Well, Colossians tells us a few things. Make allowances for each other's faults. Boy, that happens everywhere, right? <laughs> Everybody does that at work for you. Everybody, you know, everybody gives everybody a whole lot, bunch of latitude when they make mistakes. No way. Paul says, make allowances for other people's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. <laughs> right. You had me with love people, but forgive? Come on now. I mean, I just ruined some of your day right there. Forgive people who offend you. Don't go tell them they offended you. Don't go be angry at them. Just forgive them. Move on. Life's too short. And he says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Remember how messed up, remember all the things you've done wrong, all the offenses you've committed against God? He forgave you, so you forgive others. That's experiencing the perfect love of God. Those are big things to do. That's going to help us unify it. But this is what Paul says. Above all, the number one thing you can do, and here's your fashion advice for the day, is clothe yourself with what? Love. And again, he's talking about love for one another which binds us all together in perfect harmony. What did Jesus pray that we would have? Perfect unity. What provides perfect harmony is when we love one another because God is love. And we love because God loved us first. And there's so much power in being able to express that one to another in the diverse body of Christ. And if we can learn to love one another, I happen to believe, that 3.2 billion Christians in 30 million churches across 40,000 denominations in six different divisions can represent one Jesus in a beautiful way. Let's pray. Lord, we have uh, not done a good job with this. I have not done a good job with this. I have been afraid, Lord, of people who believe differently than I do in the Christian church. I have been afraid of what would happen if doctrines and beliefs were to spread. And I have had more fear than love at times for people who are following you. And that's not right. So God, I I pray that you would forgive me of that and that you would help me to express your love in a more perfect way. That you would help me, God, to take seriously your word, to take seriously my convictions about your word, but that I would pray for others who I see maybe behaving in a way that I think is weird or sinful. And I would leave that in your hands. And God, give me an open heart and an open mind to to be able to listen and seek to understand, Lord, other people's beliefs in the Christian faith. God, help us to be a church that's centered on the gospel where we can come together and some can worship one way and others can worship another way and some can believe one way and others believe another way and some can live one way and others can live another way, but we can be centered on the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins. 
And help us navigate these waters, Lord, as it is complex when you start talking about being a local church. And as we really seek to kind of define what that means, I pray that you'd help us to always stay true to two things, to loving you and loving others. And help us to pray for those who might behave differently than we do. Help us not to be afraid, God, but to love first because you loved us first. I thank you for that. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you're so good and kind that you forgive us. I thank you that you've forgiven me, Lord, for those moments where I have not represented you well amongst your body. Lord, I pray that we would shine brightly and that our world would see how much you love them as we love one another. And I ask this all because of what Jesus Christ has done for this entire planet. Amen.